things that I hadn't ever noticed before or wasn't willing to look at. But um, but yeah, it's been uh, invaluable. But today, I want to talk a little bit about roadblocks uh, because because of the culture we live in, the society we live in, where we're constantly working toward a better version of ourselves. Part of that is the contrast of becoming that person, and it's the it's the things that hold us back and prevent us from getting there. So, what uh, if I you know what what do you think the things are? You know, when a person says, "Oh, I failed my diet," or "I didn't hit my goal." What are the things that prevent us all from hitting those goals and that progress? Lazy. Self-control. Self-control. Lazy. Laziness. Any others? I mean, there's no wrong. I mean, there's an infinite number of things that we could say. And I ask this question a lot um, when I've worked with people. You know, what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked? And how did you respond to those different things? But uh, from what I've found, most of people's answers can fall into one of these categories. So both of the things you just said could fall into you know, laziness, motivation, things like that, um, frustration, being confused. Uh, we're going to talk about each one of these individually, but they kind of all, all of these things that seemingly prevent us from getting to, to where we want to be, the reasons that prevent us, which a lot of times are, are less reasons and more excuses, time, motivation, and frustration. And so uh, I wanted to start with that first one, this, this idea of time. You think to yourself, you know, have you ever said any of these phrases? You know, I don't have enough time. There aren't enough minutes in the day. I can't find the time in my schedule. I wish I had more time. Time is waste for no one. Time is money. We have the constant um, association with time as a fixed amount or and there not being enough of that, right? But, um, you know, I, I like a lot of these, these quotes because it gives me some of the time, like I can't find time on my schedule. Well, it doesn't matter how hard you look, you're not gonna find more time than what you have, right? But that is a very common thing that we're gonna find time. No, you're not gonna find time, it's a, it's a fixed commodity. But I really like this one, time is money. And not, not because of the context that it's mostly associated with, but I like to look at time as a commodity like money. So let's, let's, uh, let's say here at Ovation, let's say we implemented a program that every day we deposited 1,000 $440 into each one of your accounts. Every day, you get $1,440. The only caveat to that is that at the end of each day, whatever is not spent during the duration of the day is goes back into the community, all right? So if you get that $1,440 each day, what are you gonna do with it? Spend it. How much of it? 1440. <laughs> 1440, right? Right? And that's easy for us to, to see that distinction that if I don't use it, I'm going to lose it, right? But we look at time in a very different way because each one of us has 1,440 minutes in a day. And we get to determine what to do with those, with those minutes, right? It's a fixed commodity. There's no such thing as being poor or rich in time. Everyone has the same limited, finite time block to deal with. And so what is it? Why are some people very, very successful with their time that they are, what they have, where others really struggle with finding time and are constantly scatterbrained and running all over the place? Um, so, you know, time, that's the first thing we have to look at, is that it is a fixed commodity, and we do not approach time with the same urgency that we do 
physical money, but what if we did? How much more successful would we be with those minutes in a day? And I don't know anyone, and I don't think it is even possible to be so present and in the moment that every single person at the end of a day, they say, yes, I used every single minute of this day to its full capacity. But, you know, little reminders throughout the day to come back and kind of to, to realign with our intention um, are going to be invaluable. The other thing that I like with time as a commodity like money is looking at the difference between spending and investing, right? So if we talk about money again, what is the difference between spending money and investing money? Credit and debit. Credit and debit, right? Absolutely. And so, you know, most of our days and most of our time is spent spending our time rather than investing our time. The biggest difference between these two is with spending it, you get something for what you spend, but once it's there, you, you, you don't have it anymore. You spend the money, you don't have the money, right? An investment promises a return on the investment. Right, so we're actually increasing the value. Right, and if we look at time to invest time, you know, what are the what do you what are the things that we spend time on throughout the day? Time wasters. Mm. <laughs> maybe it depends how much how long we eat. I, eating's necessary, but maybe we spend too much time eating. If we go on Sunday to the buffet and we go at eleven and stay until two, maybe that's a little bit of a waste. Trying to decide what to do with the time. Okay, try and decide what to do with the time. Yeah, boredom, right? <laughs> Even that, we think, think our, our cell phones, the cell phone addiction, you know, TV, accessibility, there's, we are constantly bombarded with entertainment and expectations, all these things that we, feel are so important because there's urgency all around us, but when we look at our intention, what we want, what makes us most happy, a lot of those things that we're spending our time on could be invested into our wellness a lot better if we reprioritized um, them. And that's really what this roadblock of time comes down to is the idea of, it's not about not having enough time, is, it, is this a priority? Right? Because we prioritize the things that are important to us. Right? If, if Monday morning rolled around and I didn't feel like going into work and I called Marika and said, hey, can't find the time to come into work today. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to have a job for very long. So I prioritize my vocation and go to, to work. Right? And I prioritize time spent with my kids. And so that is a part of my plan, right? And so we prioritize, uh, or we uh, prioritize the things that we want uh, in our life. So really, it's not a matter of not having enough time, it's asking ourselves, you know, and prioritizing what is most important to us and where we want to be, and then making those decisions based on that. Uh, and now we'll cut, you know, the prioritization, though, is important, and we'll come back to that at the very end, because we do have to make sure that when we're talking about prioritization, it's our priorities, and that we're not doing it for the wrong reasons or for someone else. That our priorities are, are uniquely ours and authentically ours, and that we're not doing it to please or appease someone else. Um, but uh, I love that quote on the bottom there, that. The bad news is that time flies. We've heard that one too. But the good news is we're the pilot. We get to decide what we do with our time, whether we spend it or whether we invest it and where that goes to. And that kind of takes us right into the next one, which is motivation. And this is really, really difficult because, like, like, um, like you said, laziness is a big thing. Right? So we don't get to where we want to be a lot of times because we are lazy and we procrastinate. Or maybe we're not lazy, but, um, but we're not motivated. And a lot of the time we're not motivated because we're doing it for somebody else. But, you know, we can talk about this internal versus external. 
and we look around for motivation around us. And um, that motivation is conditional, right? If, if I, uh, one of the things I used to love about a previous job, uh, Friday, every Friday afternoon I taught a class, and that was at the end of the week. The people that had already done this program had done about two to three hours of hiking every day, and then an additional three to four hours of exercise every day. Um, for Monday through Friday. And then the last class on Friday afternoon was the most physically and mentally challenging class of the week. Um, and every single week I had people come in and say, look, I don't think I have anything left. I don't think I'm gonna do anything um, today, so don't worry about it, just let me do my thing. But something amazing happened every single week People come with an expectation they're not going to be able to do anything, and they leave that class having done more. Um, and it's because of the nature of the class and the energy and how pumped up people are. But on occasion, people would come up to me and say, oh, you're so motivating. Thank you for helping me get to that next level. And, and the, yeah, it makes a person that's a trainer feel good, but I would much rather say, or I would much rather have them say, you know, Thank you for providing this opportunity for me to inspire myself and realize that I can accomplish more than I had previous. Something internal, right? Because most of what we do in terms of our dieting and exercising is external based. We're following other people's rules, other people's systems, other people's programs based on outcomes, right? Outcomes and quantitative, quantitative metrics. And so if we're promised X results, if we do these behaviors, if I eat this way or exercise this way, I'm going to receive this result, right? And I stick with it to the T. Don't break any rules, don't cheat, work my butt off, do extra, and then I don't get there, what happens? If I've gone through somebody else's outcomes, or a programs to achieve an outcome or a specific metric, maybe it's weight loss, and then I don't lose the weight. How does that make me feel? Disappointed in yourself. Disappointed, right? Rather than recognizing the progress toward the goal, I'm disappointed, right? And so we look at motivation as something that is outside of ourselves, something that's helping us move along. But ultimately, it needs to be internal motivation, but even greater than that, even if we're internally motivated, inspiration is much greater than motivation. Because inspiration, if, if you were here last week, we kind of, I, I talked about um, the difference between motivation and inspiration, but ultimately, motivation is working toward an end, right? We have an end goal, and then we are motivated, taking all the steps to that end goal to, to reach it. That's what motivation is. Inspiration is the opposite of that. It's allowing the steps to take you naturally where you organically or authentically would go. Um, this is much more tied to our intention, our purpose, why we are doing what we are doing, eating the way that we are, exercising the way that we are. Um, and so we find that the ideal scenario is the exact opposite of the way that we do most things. Instead of the external motivation, outcomes, and quantitative metrics, um, we should be looking at that based on internal inspiration process instead of outcomes, so the day-to-day decision-making, um, and, and then the uh, qualitative metrics. The, uh, and qualitative, how is that different than quantitative? What would it, an example of qualitative metrics be versus uh, quantitative? Do we know what that means? Yeah, it's just because a smaller amount of something is higher. It's, yeah, it's more, more this is more what we would consider like descriptive. This would be something like, I have less back pain. Something that I couldn't rate on a scale, like I, I can't test someone on their, their, you know, where their pain is. 
but qualitative is more about how I feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, where quantitative, it's numbers, it's benchmarks, it's outcomes. And so the qualitative process is gonna be where we're gonna find the most benefit as we're working toward, um, toward those goals. Um, if you're familiar with a guy named Simon Sinek, he's a, a corporate uh, coach or, or leader and a, a speaker that I really like. And I heard him say this one time in regard to what we do in our, our occupation. He said, working hard for something that you don't care about is stress. And working hard for something that you do care about is passion. Right? So really our mindset, why we are doing what we're doing, is much more important than what the outcome is. Right? If we look at all of the jobs of people even that work here at Ovation, I'm sure there are people that love their jobs, and I'm sure there are people that maybe don't love their jobs, even though they're doing the exact same thing. Right? So the biggest difference is our perception, our mindset, our intention in in uh, doing working hard for something that we care about versus doing it for somebody else. And, uh, and then we have this idea that consistency is greater than intensity. Consistency is greater than intensity. Um, you know, we can use exercise as a perfect example of this. If I start an exercise program, or maybe I go to the gym and get my gym membership, and I work out hard, right? I go in and I work out hard and then I go in the locker room and I take my shirt off and I look for all of the changes on my body and I don't see any, right? It's unrealistic, but we live in a society that we want results now, now, now. And so, you know, we, we go crazy and then when it doesn't, uh, when the result doesn't come, we fall off the wagon and don't do anything. But, you know, Real results for exercise. If I go to the gym and work out for eight hours today and then don't do anything for another two weeks, that's not going to lead to a sustainable kind of health progress. But if I took that same eight hours and instead spread it out to 20 or 30 minutes each day for the next two weeks, that consistency is going to yield much better results and outcome than than focusing on how invested I am, the intensity being really high. I think I talked about that previously too, this idea of intensity, right? First of the year, New Year's resolutions, everyone wants to lose weight. Intensity is really high, so they go to the gym and they get their membership, and they fill their cupboards full of all the supplements that are promised to deliver the outcome, and then sure enough, as that intensity decreases, so does our motivation and then our ability to, to follow through with what we want. So we have to remember that consistency is greater than intensity. And so we find that solution is a very personal and powerful why or purpose. Doing it for the right reasons, for ourselves. And, and um, you know, I like to use the branch chain analysis to, to determine this. If, because even people that think they're doing what they're doing for the right reasons, maybe sometimes are distracted and don't realize that it's externally driven, right? Um, the, uh, this idea of weight loss, for example. I don't believe that weight loss is a goal because it doesn't provide information. Um, about health, it doesn't do a whole lot for the individual. Like we look at weight loss, for example, and you all laughed when I mentioned that scenario of going to the, you know, seeing the changes on a day-to-day -day basis of going to the gym, seeing those change. But the same people that laugh at that scenario think it's completely normal behavior to sit or stand on the on the scale every single day and check and see the fluctuations on a day-to-day -day basis, which it doesn't come to that. So we have, um, you know, this idea, if a person says, well, my why is weight loss. I want to lose weight. It's not that, it's what that number, what weight loss means to that person. And it could mean 
so they have more time to spend with their family and loved ones. It could mean they, so that they're able to do something, some activity that they love to do, that they used to be able to do and no longer can because of mobility or flexibility. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, why am I doing this? You know, if, if somebody says, oh, you should try this diet or this exercise, the first question would be like, why? Why is that important to me? And usually we find that it's not. And we can get to where we want to be much easier when we're doing it for ourselves. And then this last one, the last roadblock is, is this idea of frustration. And frustration comes in the, uh, a lot of different forms. It comes in, in expected results that didn't come to fruition. It might be an injury or an illness. It could be misunderstanding how our bodies work listening to infomercial promises rather than reading the physiology of how the body uh, accomplishes all the things. We're constantly bombarded by mixed messaging in regard to everything that we do for our wellness. Uh, I love the quote that's from a book called How to Hug a Porcupine. <laughs> all frustration comes from unmet expectations. I love that quote. Because I used to find myself getting frustrated a lot. I was really high strung all the time. And um, I heard that quote or I read that quote and I thought, man, that is, that is specific to every type of frustration. This isn't just frustration with not being where I want to be in terms of my physical health or my weight. You know, if I get frustrated with my kids, for example, it's because I had an expectation that they would have done something a different way, that they wouldn't fight, that they could sit in the back seat of the car without slapping each other in the face, right? If I, if I get frustrated with my dog, it's because I have an expectation that they won't pee or poop in my house anymore or something like that, right? But all frustration comes from an ex our expectations. And so when we look at the expectations of who we want to be, and where we want to be in our health and all these things, where are those expectations coming from? Where did the expectations come from in regard to our health and our bodies? Past experience. Past experience? Yeah. That's one of the, I mean, this also has a number of answers. And I used to. Uh, when I taught similar principles and I would ask the same question um, in regards to the expectations, there was usually one person, it was usually the first person, they say ourself. And I always loved that answer because I got to say, thank you for sharing that answer. It's the wrong one, but, <laughs> right? Because why is that the wrong one? Why is that the wrong answer? Because we should be thinking of ourselves all the time. Yeah, right? So um, we look at the, uh, uh, these expectations. They don't come from our own body. We're not born with an inherent hatred of the way that we look or a judgment of the way our body is shaped or what we can or can't do or all of these things. Those are not part of who we are, right? Think about when a baby is born, one of the things that you hear a lot is, oh, that baby is perfect right? Perfect. Per perfect newborn. That doesn't mean that, that that baby is quantitatively perfect in every single way. There's no health concerns that everything is, there's no metric for what perfection is in regard to a baby. But at some point, we lose sight of that. We lose sight of the perfection that we are just for being human beings ourselves. And we start to look at everyone else. We play the comparison game, the judgment game, and when that gets strong enough, um, or we want to ultimately live a different life or have different results, then we seek things outside of ourselves that promise those outcomes rather than starting um, within ourselves. But, you know, this, this one is something that I've really struggled with, and I... Um, I got the opportunity, when I lived in Las Vegas, 
I was working at the Encore Resort. And I went in to teach a spin class one day. And the name on, we only had four spin bikes, so they are always fairly small, intimate classes at, at the resort. But all four lines were signed out by the exact same person. And I recognized the name as one of the host trainers of the most popular weight loss TV show um, that's ever been on TV. And I'm not saying the name of the TV show or the person because I'm recording this and I don't want a phone call. <laughs> um, but uh, so I thought, okay, this person's just gonna bring family members or, or, or colleagues or personal assistant or whatever. That's why they signed up for bikes. But turns out that they just don't like to be bothered by people in the gym when they're doing their own workout. So because of their you know, social phobia or whatever it was in the gym, I got to have this 90 minute one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone that I, I looked up to and respected because they were viewed by the world as the top of their game, the best trainers basically in the country. And so I thought it was awesome, but I also had a lot of questions because I realized that everything about that show was complete garbage. And so after, after board, uh, building a little rapport, I asked, I said, look, how do you reconcile within yourself that you are the face of this franchise or this program that on the surface level is very motivational, that's very uplifting, um, that's helping people become better versions of themselves, but you know, because you are a health professional, you know that most of the things that, that are shown on the show are doing <coughs> the exact opposite, a huge disservice, because the results aren't real results, the methods aren't real methods, it's edited to, to show one thing for entertainment. So how do you, I, do, I don't remember how I asked him, I basically said, how do you live with yourself in a much more <laughs> tactful way? Um, but uh, the answer was validation first, which I, blew me away, he's like, you're right. But it has provided the life that I've always wanted. And so that was a trade-off that he was willing to, to make. Um, but, but that being said, he went on to share with me. He said, you know what, I wish it wasn't that way, it's like, but it's TV, it's entertainment. He's like, would you watch a weight loss competition show about one to two pounds of weight loss a week? That's not very riveting. You're not gonna have sponsors knocking down the doors to pay to support that message. And so he shared with me all of the tricks of the trade that the TV show uses to manipulate the numbers, to make it more entertaining, not to make it more healthy or more realistic, to make it more entertaining. And so, you know, he said that the biggest glaring inconsistency is that as a person that watches the show, it's a week to week syndicated show, one watching would assume or deduce that those results were one week results, right? It's every single week. But he shared with me that one episode was typically made up of anywhere from three to four weeks of content. So at home, we were watching closer to one month results than we were one week results, right? So that was the first thing. And then the second thing, all of the tricks with uh, inflation of numbers at the beginning for weigh-ins with bloating and having everyone drink as much water as they can possibly stomach, and then using sweatsuits and diuretics and laxatives and saunas and all these things to completely eliminate the water from the body for way outs, to make it more entertaining, right? And meanwhile, those of us that watch the show are watching these people on the TV taking control of their lives, and we've got tears running down our face as we're feeling what they're feeling, and, and we think to ourselves, we get this expectation, if only I could work out with that trainer, Right? If only I could have access to this program or this, 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 these conditions, then I'd have the outcome that I wanted, right? That's the downside of expectations. And so the, uh, the 
answer, I guess, to this frustration is to, first of all, to calibrate or eliminate the expectations if we can. And that's much easier to do when we shift away from outcome metrics. If, if we're not moving our bodies and eating the way to lose weight, we're doing it just to feel better, and we're checking in with ourselves every meal on how we feel, the results, the physical results that we want will come. We're just not conditioning it on, on a number, and we're not feeling bad and guilting and shaming ourselves because we're not already there. Um, and so frustration can be a big one, but the more we can get away from expectation, outcome-focused metrics, the, uh, the uh, better off we're gonna be. And ultimately, the, the overarching answer to all of those, to the time, motivation, and frustration roadblocks is this, intentional and purposeful living in the present moment. If we live in a way that at any moment we, you know, I like to sometimes set an alarm that just says, check in with your intention. And so I'll be maybe driving down the road or I might be in the middle of teaching a class or doing something else and I'll get this little reminder for me to kind of pull back, come back to the center moment, recalibrate my expectations, what I'm doing in the moment, and ultimately if it's the most I could do to invest that time with as I move throughout the day. And those little check-ins go a really long way because intentional and purposeful living in the present moment is not the status quo that our society and all co our culture is the, is, the, is the baseline, right? We are constantly bombarded with entertainment, time wasters that are outside of ourselves that have no implication on ourselves or our goals or our purpose or our why at all, but we are so invested in them. Sports is a great example of that. And I, I like sports. I grew up playing sports, loving sports. I was a, um, I'm a, a big um, professional football fan, and my favorite team is it was the San Diego Chargers. Now they're in LA, but um, it was probably about a decade ago. Now they were supposed to win the Super Bowl that year. They were favored to go all the way. They were incredible, and they lost in the second round of the playoffs. And when they lost, my expectation was that they were gonna finally win the title. And it ruined my life for like two weeks at the time. I couldn't function. And it drove me crazy that all of those athletes who just lost the game, they were high-fiving and shaking hands with the other team after. Like, I cared more about the outcome of that game than the actual players did, right? And we look around right now with even March Madness, Right? The wins and losses of these games, I mean, there are individuals in, that have family members or their alma mater, so maybe it means something to them, but the majority of people don't have any vested interest, unless they're gambling on it, vested interest in the outcomes of those games. And we're constantly surrounded by all of these things that are taking our attention away from our intention and the present moment. Um, so yeah, intentional, purposeful living in the present rather than this chaotic trying to compare and catch up with the Joneses and, and be something that we aren't, constantly being uh, depressed and frustrated about problems or issues in the past and having fear and anxiety about the future that very rarely do we ever get the ability to just checking with ourselves and our attention in the moment. But if we do that, it's going to take care of not only those obstacles, but all of the other obstacles that might come up um, as, as we progress toward wellness. And I don't like to think of wellness as an outcome, it's a process. So there's no end point, it's a constant um, recalibration on a day-to-day -day basis. But that's what I got for you. Any questions, any comments today? Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Well, it's lunchtime. Although you all probably had brunch, so. <laughs>